coming up on Reframed. Along with this week's special guest, Nina Tang, which I'm very, very excited to have on. Today we'll be discussing a good old classic Disney film, Finding Nemo. They're not going to fix it. You know, they're not going to come up with a cure for it because there isn't one. What I saw on screen, I I love pretty much all of it. So I was a bit like, <laughs> I'm on Team Nemo. Welcome back to Reframed, the podcast that reframes how disability is portrayed in film and TV. I'm your host, Jason Climo, and today I have my wonderful co-host with me, Stephanie Dower, and along with this week's special guest, Nina Tame, which I'm very, very excited to have on. Today we'll be discussing a good old classic Disney film, Finding Nemo, but before we do, let's say hello to Nina and learn a little bit more about them. So welcome to the podcast, Nina. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Did you want to just kick us off by telling everyone a bit about you and what you do? Yes, I am Nina and I'm a disability advocate, a writer, a mentor. Some would say influencer, which makes me want to vomit, but I'm still I'm still going to say it. Um, yeah, that's what I do. I do most of my work on Instagram. I make a lot of content around disability and dispelling the kind of outdated myths around disability, as well as kind of using my background in, in counselling to kind of mentor other disabled people. So that's who I am. I mean, yeah, as you said, you're very active on social media, which we absolutely love. Uh, One particular topic you quite often mention is how parents talk about their disabled children online. Um, Can you, you know, which is obviously very relevant to this episode, if we'll be talking about Finding Nemo, um, can you sort of elaborate on some of the main things that you have um, highlighted in your own content around this topic? Yeah, of course. So I was born with spina bifida um, and I've also got one of my sons. I've got four kids and one of my sons has got spina bifida as well. And when he was first born, um, I didn't even identify as being disabled back then. And like a lot of parents, you know, like we were offered termination after termination during my pregnancy just because he had the same thing as me. And kind of by the time he was born, I just sort of wanted to sort of share about him from the rooftops and I did I used to share kind of physio appointments on my Instagram and all of this stuff and then as I kind of went along in my journey and I embraced being disabled I found the disabled community I suddenly was doing so much learning um, in such a short space of time like I sort of you know was reading about the social model of disability and found the disabled community online it was just like this all of this stuff seemed to happen at once and my brain was just like okay we've got a lot of unlearning to do um and as I became sort of although I was born disabled I didn't sort of start using mobility aids until about nine years ago um and obviously like everybody as soon as I started using mobility aids it was the constant sort of questions from strangers and then when my kids started school he was getting the same thing and when he first started school we would encourage him just to answer you know we informed him all about his condition so he'd be empowered to answer those questions but he still was so kind of like you know just had enough of it he just wanted to play he didn't want to be questioned constantly Mm -hmm. and then we were like you know what you don't have to answer you don't have to answer those questions like at all you can literally tell people to bugger off it's none of their business (laughs) um but I realized that I was empowering him that he didn't have to answer, but at the same time, a stranger could go on my Instagram and then read about his medical stuff on there. And suddenly it was like, oh my God, what am I doing? No, like, um, and it was just this real sort of big light bulb moment for me, um, you know, in regards to his boundaries. So, you know, we stopped sharing. He, you know, he'll appear occasionally in my stories and that's it, but I won't talk about anything to do with his medical stuff because, that's nobody else's business. And I think that, you know, as you know, disabled people are so often seen as medical curiosities, and that's all anybody wants to know about, they don't really care about the sort of societal issues we face, like, you know, if you're a wheelchair user, lack of access, everything else, but they'll want to know why you're in a wheelchair, what's wrong with you. Um, And I just think it's this same kind of pattern that's happened forever with disabled people we're just seen as medical curiosities so I kind of sort of it's something I talk about on my Instagram you know a fair amount is this kind of you know share your disabled kids obviously like you would your non-disabled kids 
But if we're not sort of sharing our non-disabled kids' medical stuff on Instagram, which I'm sure some parents are, but for, on the whole, people wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, you know, <clears throat> Tommy had a doctor's appointment today and this is what happened, you know, then don't do it for your disabled kids. Like how lovely just to see a family and, and one of them happens to be a kid in a wheelchair or a kid with crutches or or whatever. Like we just... I don't feel that anybody benefits, any strangers on the street or online benefit from knowing about spina bifida, knowing what it is. They're not going to fix it. You know, they're not going to come up with the cure for it because there isn't one. Whereas if they knew more about the sort of societal barriers that I face and other disabled people face, those are the things that can be changed. Um, Mm. I remember once, like years and years ago, Right, so I'd I'd put some cake. This is this is relevant, okay? So I'd put, I'd put some cake in the bin, and then realised that that was a mistake. So I ate the cake from the bin, and I put it on as a Facebook status, as you do, just eating some cake out the bin, because those are the sort of interesting statuses that I used to do, sort of fifteen years ago. Um, and then the next morning, as I was taking one of my other sons to school, his friend shouted across the road, your mum eats cake out of bins because his mum had been my friend on Facebook and he'd seen it. It was fine. You know, it was fine. But I use that to highlight how, you know, on social media, nothing is necessary. You know, it's not private. And no. if you are sharing about your disabled kids incontinence issues or something, and yeah. there is a very real chance that that could get back to, you know, kids in their class. And yeah. you're kind of, <clears throat> if my mum had <laughs> put on the internet about my incontinence when I was a kid, I think I'd have needed therapy for life. Um, yeah. And I just think, you know, you're sharing, you know, parents, and I know that the intention behind it is good and it's about, you know, education and normalising and everything else, but... You're yeah. still sharing really personal details about somebody who, you know, once they're out there, they're out there. And, you know, we all know sort of, you know, for me, there was a big difference for me being a sort of kid with a disability to being a teenager with a disability, you know. Yeah. That is just somewhat harder and your feelings change towards it. So I just, yeah, I'm just very, very against it. Yeah. And it's the whole like, you know, conversation around consent and all that kind of stuff as well. Like it's, it's a big conversation, but I think you tackle it so well and with your own lived experience as well, just really laying it out for people to just be like, it's just not necessary anyway. Like you've said, like telling your mates how, you know, your kids medical appointment went, like how, how does that benefit anybody other than just like creates more curiosity out there in society because they're like oh did you see nina's son did this and it's like oh my god it's just exhausting and it's not actually like doing anything beneficial for any disabled people in society at all i think it also reinforces the fact that like you know uh people feel too comfortable sometimes coming up to people with disabilities and asking them curious questions like not every person with a disability is exists to educate you or to you know to an example of something if a person with a disability grows up and wants to educate others through their own lived experiences like kind of what we're doing on this podcast they will make that decision they won't you know as a child they can't make that decision for themselves necessarily they don't understand you know if i used to say to clark oh is it okay if i share this and he'd say yeah because he didn't really know what that for us what he was yeah. saying yes you know what that meant um and I just sort of, like you say, it just normalises that entitlement to know what a disabled person's medical thing is. And there's this amazing book um, by James Catchpoles called What Happened to You? Um, because James grew up as an amputee. And so he's wrote this children's book all about how, you know, he just wants to play. You don't need to know these kind of questions. But interestingly, there's another kid's book called Just Ask, which is literally got um, the complete opposite message, which is like, yes, disabled children just want to be spoken to. So just go and ask them about what's and it's like no. there's a very fine line yes yeah it's like just you have to be careful with that messaging right. like i yes. know so carly finlay a previous guest of ours wrote a book called say hello and the whole messaging around that is like don't don't teach your kids to ignore disabled people either mm. and not look like don't yeah. do the whole like oh don't look don't look sort mm. of thing for people who have like visible disabilities 
Um, but yeah, you need to be careful about the whole, like, just ask. Cause it's like, okay, well I'll ask I think, everything. <laughs> like, I, yeah. think, I, I think, I think the message is, is like, think about, okay, if this was a non-disabled person, would I be reacting in this way? Or would I be asking these questions? If you, if the answer is no, don't do that. <laughs> or if somebody asked me this question, would it feel invasive? Yes or no? Yeah, you say yes, yeah. probably don't ask it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I think it, it's just, you know, teaching kids that, you know, when you become friends with somebody, that's the natural part yeah. of friendship is that you both yeah. divulge little bits, like little tidbits yeah. about each yeah. other. And, you know, and as that's you're ready. How, yeah, as you're ready. And yeah. then the other person might share something. And then that's what brings you closer. But just going up to yeah. somebody, even if it's not, you know, we teach kids that you wouldn't go up to somebody and comment on their weight. You know, mm. we, mm. we sort of we teach them that. And really, I think it should just be we don't comment on people's bodies full stop. You know, and, and I, th- I think that goes for grown-ups and kids and, you know, we just don't need to be commenting on people's size or their mobility aids or, you know, whatever it is. It's just, yeah. More related to what we're talking about on the podcast today, why do you, Nina, think genuine representation of disability in film and TV is so important? Because I think that, you know, people's idea of disability hasn't particularly moved on you know, since the days where we were either being put in care homes or we were being put in a room at home and we never sort of saw the world. And because a lot of people don't necessarily know a disabled person, people's ideas of disability are formed through TV and media. And currently, obviously, bar, you know, I know you've discussed some excellent sort of shows already. Um, But in general, we know that the portrayal of disability is, you know, pity or inspiration porn or as a vehicle for a non-disabled person to be a superhero. Like, (laughs) literally. Yeah. And that's it. You know, so I totally get why for most people, they do feel uncomfortable around disability. They do sort of still feel this um, entitlement to ask about the medical, because again, if you ever see a disabled person more like, um, you know, a news article or, or in those sort of uh, programs, you'll always find out what their diagnosis is, always. Always. I always feel like I'm not allowed to be on anything. And let, it's almost like, well, you have to give that over. We're going to give you this airtime, but we do need to know what's wrong with you just in case we could catch it's it. It's a trade. It's a it's, trade. It's the trade. But isn't that like that with everything, though? Whatever we need to access yeah. as disabled people, you have to give over a little bit of your dignity first and then you can have And it. I've, ref- I've like started to refuse and I haven't probably done a lot of media stuff other than like this, obviously, um, for a while. And few years ago I was like refused and obviously it's out there what my diagnosis is and so they've like gone and found it and included it in like the heading anyway and I just was like oh my god like why would you even like you know at the start of our conversation I was like oh yeah I'd prefer not to have that in the article Mm. if you're like oh well I need to have it in there then I would be like okay well I'm probably not the best person to have this article on then like Mm. find someone else I mean I will I tend to always mention it like yeah but i pref- i like that to be my decision i don't want yeah. that to be you know my medical i'm happy to be called you know you know identify as being disabled and i'm happy with yes. that wheelchair user whatever else but i don't feel my actual medical diagnosis has any mm. great bearing on anything because Literally. myself and you jason have very different diagnosis but we also both mm. share very similar things because we're both wheelchair users yes yeah. you know so that's kind of yeah so i think representation in its current kind of form although it is slowly getting better it's still just can't say the word but still kind of um you know keeps these kind of stereotypes and everything going um whereas when you kind of have you know like there's just I love seeing incidental disability in sort yeah. of films and TV where, you know, you don't ever find out what's wrong with them, that the actual, it has nothing to do with their disability. Um, it's just a disabled person. And I think the more we kind of have that, um, and obviously I know not all disabilities are visible, but talking as somebody, you know, who is a wheelchair user. So from my point of view, the more we sort of see wheelchair users, people with crutches, walking sticks, whatever else, and 
you know, it isn't about their disability. It just becomes then this other part of life, no different to how people aren't weirded out by somebody who wears glasses. Because, you know, if every time you had somebody in a film who wore glasses, you know, you had to find out why they wore glasses and when did they start using them. And, you know, and the film actually has to be about this person with their glass. It would be ridiculous. And, and that's what I want to see with disability. And that's why I just think representation is such an important step. Um, yeah. because while we're still kind of seen as this other, um, we're not seen as even having the same needs as everybody else. So we're not seen as people who want to go out with more than just their carer. You know, we're not seen yeah. as needing an education or needing to be paid the same because people don't even think we work in the first place. You know, it's, I think, yeah. true representation. I mean, it sounds like gross saying it, but it humanises us. And it shouldn't even be like that, but we are seen as not the same, as like almost this different species of people. Um, so I think, yeah, representation is just massively important in my opinion. Well, I think we agree here, given the podcast that we do. Um, couldn't agree more. Uh, so where can our audience follow you or if they want to perhaps work with you sometime, uh, where can they where can they find you online? Mainly Instagram. I'm sort of Nina Tame, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, just, yeah. But my TikTok's basically everything from my Instagram with an occasional video where I try and do a trend like the young people and it doesn't yes. work. So that's that's all there is on there. It's bad. Amazing. I'm going to go watch Amazing. all of those now. <laughs> Don't do that. Please go give Nina a follow. She is just delightful. And also when she's not being hilarious, she's... I mean, I feel like you're also educational and hilarious at the same time. So even when she's educational, she's still hilarious. You'll love it. You'll learn heaps. I know, like, you know, I feel like advocates learn from each other all of the time, but I still learn so much from you, Nina, and just your own experiences and the way that you actually explain things in such an eloquent way. So I really appreciate having you in my life. And I think that everybody who's following along today uh, with this episode should go and give you a bit of a follow and show you lots, lots of love. So you're so sweet. That made me feel a bit emotional. I think it's because my period's due. It's not just due. Oh. That, <laughs> that was really nice. Thanks, Jess. Now, time to jump into our film for today, which is Finding Nemo. Steph, did you want to give us, I mean, do we even need it? I feel like we don't even need it, but just do it anyway for the formalities of it. Let me humor you, okay? Yeah. Let me tell you the story. Surely of everybody's Nemo. seen it by now. I don't know. I think you'll find some people out there. I mean, mm, they're true. a little behind the times, but they may be out there. True. Um, so <laughs> for those who are not aware, uh, Finding Nemo is a Disney Pixar animated classic that follows an overly cautious clownfish named Marlon as he embarks on a journey to find his son Nemo, who has been abducted by a scuba diver and is taken from the Great Barrier Reef all the way down to Sydney. Along Marlon's journey, he meets an eclectic mix of sea creatures, including sharks, turtles, pelicans, and of course, the ever lovable and yet slightly forgetful Dory. Uh, now, the main reason that we're talking about finding Nemo here on Reframed is Nemo himself is actually born with an underdeveloped fin. Plus, there are other scatterings of disability representation in other characters throughout the film. So lots to explore, lots to discuss. Um, who wants to kick it off? Nina, you can start us off. What were your just initial thoughts? I think, first of all, it's just to see disability framed in a kind of neutral slash positive light um, compared to where most of the time in Disney films, disability is very much the villain of the film. Um, you know, when we look at so many characters over the years that, you know, are the villain and they are, you know, portrayed as having a disability. So for a start, I just, I think that's lovely how it's kind of seamlessly in there. Um, and maybe, you know, for a lot of people, it wouldn't even register that, oh, this is a disabled character. But if yeah. you are a kid that's got a limb difference or something like that, then you are going to relate to that, which I just think is lovely. Yeah. On that, I, so like I've acquired my impairment for anyone who's new to the podcast and didn't know that already. Um, and prior to acquiring my impairment, I would obviously seen Finding Nemo a few times. And I literally was that person that just didn't even register that the film featured any kind of characters with disability, let alone so many, like there's probably more than we'll even have time to talk about today. 
And now looking back at that, like literally it probably didn't even register to me until we actually started doing Reframed and I actually started jotting down like different films that I wanted to analyze and Finding Nemo was one of them. And I was like, oh my God, there is so much disability representation in this and it's actually really good. But at the time when I first watched it, it just didn't actually register to me and it's that whole incidental or incidental enough, I guess. Like it's not fully incidental, but it's incidental enough that people go, this is just a normal part of a you know, normal part of the kind of diversity in the characters. Um, and so then it's that, and it's that type of portrayal that then helps them have those same thoughts about real disabled people in the real world. I think that's what animation can do so well, isn't it? It can transport not just kids, but adult audiences as well into these worlds where we sort of remove the preconceived connotations that we bring to humans that we you know different kinds of human beings different kinds of experiences and we can sort of strip that away and just give ourselves into this world of diversity that um the pixar of course and disney well pixar in particular is so so good at doing um yeah i think you know i know when i obviously was a kid and watching finding nemo for the first time even as someone who grew up with disability, I didn't look at it and was like, this is a disabled film. Like it was just a good movie and it felt like I don't know anyone that couldn't relate to someone in that film because of the diversity of it. It wasn't just even disability. So um, I think, yeah, I think it's if we could see more of that, this kind of representation, um, particularly in kids' films because kids then grow up and hopefully take that through the rest of their lives. Um, yeah, like it's it's what we want to see more of. Yeah, there was yeah. that. I don't know if we're supposed to talk, like. I don't know if I'm allowed to mention another thing, and I actually can't remember the yeah, name of it, it either. But there was this. Why has the name gone out? It's a, a recent film about the boys who are fish and their boys and their. Mom. Oh, Luca. Yeah. yeah, and I yeah. just we watched that, and like the dad who had the sort of limb oh. difference, who was so yeah. matter of fact about it, and he was just <laughs> like, I just loved him. Like just little bits like that, where it's just <laughs> yeah, you know, there's none of the other sort of you know like with Nemo there's not you know you're not sort of automatically being like oh what an inspirational little disabled fish <laughs> you know it's yeah, it's not it's so yeah. woven in there so beautifully that it, you, yeah. you know it's not through that well this is an inspirational film about a disabled person overcoming the odds you know it's not got any of that and as you say it's often not until afterwards and somebody points it out or whatever that you're like oh right yeah they were disabled um and I think that kind of just shows that sort of spectrum of of human diversity that so often it's like disabled, non-disabled, when it's not like that, you know, it's it's so much broader than that. And, and it's not even, you know, obviously uh, we've talked about how there are different types of disability representation in this. Um, mental health as well, like Marlon, Marlon is not, also first of all, this is actually Marlon's film. Like I know yeah. the title is Finding Nemo, Marlon is the protagonist. It, mm. We follow his journey. Nemo has his own little journey in the fish tank, but this is Marlon's journey, and That's it's right. about him yeah. overcoming his overprotectiveness and his very deep-seated anxiety, which is well justified given the beginning of the film. But, mm. um, yeah, so it, it was really – I think it's quite interesting to see the different types of disabilities. It's not just physical. It's not just cognitive with Dory. Yeah. It's – mental health as well with the anxiety that Marlon is feeling and facing so and it's the exact thing that we like constantly are asking for on this podcast from film and tv shows that feature you know that aren't animations like feature like real humans I guess um is that we don't we we need more than just that one token disabled experience in the film like there isn't just one disabled experience in the world so when you're building the world around around your film, you need to actually have multiple experiences factored in to the narrative. Like you might not even have more than two disabled characters, but it needs to be clear that there's more than just one disabled person in that universe and more than one disabled experience, which I think Finding Nemo just does so well. And like you said, is sort of the power of animation as well as in they can create characters and do what they like with them, which is great. I think like probably the biggest like thing that I love and like at times like hated whilst watching is Marlon and his transformation as a parent of 
a fish with disability or a, a person can we say person fish i don't know whatever having it having a disabled son <laughs> Um, but you know, from the start, it's all about like, you just can't Nemo and is like essentially removing Nemo's own agency to actually make decisions for himself and really reinstilling in Nemo that you can't do things because you're disabled. Mm. Um, or, you know, I'm deciding for you because you're disabled that, you know, gave me the ick, but you know, in, in the same respect, like it's important, I guess, in some ways to actually demonstrate that experience because it's a real world experience for some disabled children as well. Mm. But then towards the end of the film, what I love is that you kind of get different epiphany moments within characters and their own beliefs of other characters and, you know, what they need. And, you know, I guess Nemo gets his own agency back in some respects because Marlon has that epiphany moment and actually transforms his own perception of disability. No, I I feel the same because I remember watching it obviously a lot younger than I am now and and feeling that same kind of ick and kind of being reminded of maybe some of my experiences where I was told, well, you know, you can't do that because you're disabled. You can't do that. That will hurt your back, you know, whatever it was. So I was a bit like, I'm on Team Nemo. Um, But actually, you know, I can kind of relate now as a mum to a disabled kid that sort of, you know, there is that, you know, worry. And, you know, I I think I can kind of relate more now to the dad and understand why he had that kind of extra anxiety about, you know, sending his kid, because it's anxiety inducing anyway with all your kids. But, you know, if you know that you, you know, for me, I know that I sort of worry in different ways about my disabled kid, which is more to do with how the world will perceive him, how the world would treat him, you know, all of that stuff that I don't want him to have to deal with, but I know he will. And, you know, and obviously we, you know, we empower him to be able to do that. But yeah, I think that that sort of change, that realization at the end that, you know, well, maybe I didn't give my kid enough credit. um, Maybe I didn't give them enough autonomy um, is, is beautiful to, you know, because I think, you know, in real life, I've seen parents kind of have that, journey and be a bit like oh god I don't know if I want to let them go and do that but actually I'm just going to sit on my feelings and I'm going to let them because it's important that they can um because I think you know I I probably grew up quite nervy and not somebody now who's very good at trying new things and stuff like that so it's always you know I mean we go the opposite with Clark if he even tries to use his as an excuse like, do not use your disability as an excuse. That's terrible. You can do it. Um, you know, it, it's important to us that we don't ever sort of hold him back with our own, you know, anxieties and, and stuff. And, and and I think that's what um, is important to point out with Marlon's reaction to Nemo is that was actually Marlon's sort of issues that he had to work through. It wasn't actually because of Nemo or Nemo's disability it was Marlon had first of all a traumatic experience at the beginning of the film where he lost his wife and his other unborn or soon to be born children um so Nemo is like his one one you know family member left so you know and obviously he's just a very anxious fish to begin with so it was actually Marlon's issues that he had to deal with um, and that's what he that's what he got on this journey was understand himself better and Nemo got to have his own experience and his own um, coming of age journey um, elsewhere so then when they came back together they knew each other better or no sorry knew themselves better mm, and could better yeah. relate to each other and understand each other's perspectives better so I think just you know not not just from a disability perspective but just a relationship perspective and that you know, coming to learn who you are as a as a person perspective. Like I think um, they touched on a lot, a lot in this film, mm. um, a lot of growth. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's why so many people relate to it is because like yeah. there's that such strong focus on like relationships. Like mm. you know, it's about parental relationships, about um, relationships between friends, it's about relationships mm. between like almost strangers as well. When Nemo is like thrown into the tank and is introducing himself to all these new people and almost kind of yeah. has to justify his existence and all that kind of stuff as well. And speaking of that, I feel like there's one point where I just don't know how I feel about it. And maybe mm. I'm reading into it too much. So this is why I bring it up because I want someone to tell me what they think. 
is the part where Nemo is like actually escapes out of the tank. And I don't know, I feel like it's like built up into this whole like, he's not going to be able to do it because of his fin. But then he does it. And I'm like, is this some sort of like weird ploy at overcoming disability or am I am I stretching somebody just sort me out here I I I sort of thought a bit more on this um in preparation for our conversation and what it was actually was Nemo had sort of taken on board maybe a little too much of his his father's anxieties and worries about him and he was as um as you were saying Nina um he was actually using his disability as an excuse kind of he was thinking like no I can't do it I can't do it whereas the other fish in the tank particularly Gil who was almost like came to be kind of like a mentor um to Nemo because he actually shared the same um uh fin deformity um he was actually being like no you know don't use that as an excuse don't let us hear you do, you know you can do it you are actually strong enough in yourself that you can do that so it may have been slightly inspirational porn-ish if you read it in that way, but I actually think it was just a great moment for Nemo to understand his in, his inner strength and sort of strip away some of his father's overprotectiveness and, and anxieties around and sort of, um, yeah, again, sort of it was more of a coming-of-age moment rather than a... Yeah, true. He didn't, he didn't overcome his... Dis- he didn't fix his disability. Yeah. But... Kind of used it to his advantage yep. so which i think i don't know I, I think sometimes if i can use my disability to my advantage i i see that as a good thing yeah <laughs> i think it goes to yeah. show though isn't it that how much we're kind of pigeonholed and sort of suffocated yeah. by that sort of inspiration poor narrative that actually sometimes there might be stuff that we achieve you know, like I might do something like, I don't know, the other day I stood up uh, for about 60 seconds in the kitchen while Jace was like holding me and I was like, oh, well done me. But then I'm like, oh God, I'm inspiration porn in myself. Like, yeah. you know, I, I think it's it's hard for as us as disabled people to kind of have these achievements with our bodies mm-hmm. without yeah. feed, like without that narrative coming in. Oh, well, you've overcome your disability then. Well, no, clearly I yeah. haven't. I'm still in a wheelchair, yeah. you know, and it's, but I think it's, you know, it's the same as I think, you know, how sometimes it's hard to express anything negative about being disabled without, you know, yeah. a non-disabled person waiting in the wings to go, ha ha, I told you it was terrible. Um, <laughs> I knew you were a fraud. You yeah. do hate it. <laughs> See, we were right. Yeah. So I, I think it's sort of, yeah, I think with that kind of scene, it's I can see why in your head you'd be a bit like, oh, is that a little bit like that? Um, yeah. And I actually think that like, it was something more like actually in my own beliefs and in head that I had to probably actually hear someone else explain to me. Cause I'm also like, it also think, I think it came down to the whole that we have this whole like protective gross thing where it's like, we can't push disabled people to like challenge themselves. We just need to make sure they're always just comfortable because they can't be challenged because otherwise they'll just break. And I feel like that's actually where I was going with that thought without even realizing is that like, actually that moment was about coming of age about Nemo being like, I can challenge myself. I can't do everything, but I can challenge myself to do this. And this is something that I can do. I'm going to go and do it. Like it's outside of my comfort zone, but I can get out of outside of my comfort zone. So anyway, it's time to give our scores out of five on the IDR scale. Steph, did you want to kick us off? What did you score Finding Nemo? Yeah, I uh, I sort of struggled with coming up with a score for this one um, because in terms of like what I saw on screen, I I loved pretty much all of it. Like there wasn't there wasn't much that I could could pull down, but I'm guessing given the year that this was made back in the early 2000s, I don't think authenticity behind the scenes probably was was a priority back then and I I didn't see any um, information online about if there was any sort of uh, disability consultation or disability um, you know disabled people working behind the scenes so I'm not really sure if that can factor into my score but it might a little bit I think I've come to the decision that I'm going to give it a four out of five um because, yeah, what I saw on screen, loved it. Um, uh, a very, I think, a very important film um, for 
disability representation given given the time as well it's Absolutely. um it was used very well yeah yeah i was very similar i couldn't find anything about like any disabled people working as writers or even like you know obviously as consultants which we don't love that whole concept but um yeah. Yeah, and I and I wasn't even sure about um, the voice actors or anything as well. So I'm going to give it a four point five because I'm going to take most of it on face value, uh, and yeah. I feel like it was a really great representation. And I feel like, like you've said, and like we've said it so many times, like having these types of portrayals in kids and animation films is just so great, and it's so informative for the for where we're going into the future as well. So. Um, makes me very excited obviously they're building on that and it was on oh god almost 10 years ago which scares me that this came out um and they've they've got a ways to go as well no no, so. no, no. it was oh, almost 20, 20. sorry oh, god yeah. <laughs> sorry you just oh, lost 10 years sick <laughs> <laughs> sorry nina um yeah i would say four because i think the actual you know, on the face value of it, the representation you've got there and how much that would mean to, you know, I always think about always think about the kids, how much that would mean to a disabled kid, I think is lovely. But as you said, I don't feel like it was intentionally made to be like, let's make a great kids film for disabled kids that they I don't feel like I feel like it was almost accidental. Um yeah, that would that would be that and also I would I always feel like it's people seem to find it easier to discuss disability with animals. Like a lot of disabled kids yeah. books will be a bear that's got one leg or a giraffe that's whatever. Like yeah. I would just, yeah, just again, longing for the day where we kind of see that, you know, as a kid's thing, but with actual, you know, whether they're animated yeah, or not like on humans. Would, would yeah. Be nice. yeah. Humans. Yeah. It would yeah. Be like nice. we want to see like inside out or soul or something like that. Mm. Like human looking yes. character can still be animation but human based characters that have disability. Yeah. Yeah. And that they don't That's kind of interesting point that like, you know, almost 20 years ago, they were getting it right with fish, but they're not really <laughs> doing it now with the human animation characters. Yeah. Well, we watched, have you seen, um, have you seen Shazam? No. So it's not really a, ch oh. it's not really a children's children's film, but maybe sort of older mm -hmm. children. And it's a, it's a superhero film, but there's a kid in it with crutches. He's amazing throughout the whole film. You don't know why he's got crutches, but at the end, I'm about to give you a big spoiler for it as well. He becomes like all this group of kids, they all become superheroes, but he loses his crutches. And I remember loving oh, yeah. it up until that point where I thought, that would have just been such a good move to have turned those crutches into, you know, given them a little gadget or something yeah. that went with it. But no, you chose to remove the disability because now he's a superhero. And that was like, yeah. See, that's mm. overcoming disability. That's, 100 that's what that is overcoming about. disability. But also it's like you could make him fly and like his crutches could just like stick to his back. And then well, when he's it. like walking around, he just needs his crutches. But they're just, yeah, they could have like lasers in him or something. It's, yeah. So... <laughs> Still got a long 100%. way to go. We do. We do. On that note, I do want to say a big thank you to the two of you for joining me on this week's episode. And thank you everyone at home for following along as well, listening, watching along with this week's Reframed episode. We want to hear what you thought about Nina as well as Finding no, Nemo. No, you don't. Just, just, <laughs> Nina's like, no, no opinions. <laughs> just Nemo, not me. <laughs> Nemo and Nina. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> um you can find us on all of our different social media channels if you search reframe podcast or podcast reframed we'll show up on facebook instagram and twitter if email is better for you shoot us an email to hello at reframepodcast.com um and lastly i just want to say a big thank you again to the community broadcasting foundation for helping to fund this series Otherwise, that is it for us today. Thank you so, so much again, Nina, for joining us. Oh, thank, thank you, you for having me. You're very thank welcome. Thank you. It was a fantastic conversation. And we will see you all again next week with another fantastic episode of Reframed. Bye. Bye.